Bonjour! Welcome to Natalingo's Nata with Natalie Paris. You are listening to episode two. So, what has happened in the classroom? I wanted to share with you some of the work that I do with two little mascots which I have called Mini Miss Paris and Pablo. Mini Miss Paris I bought at the Tour Montparnasse in Paris for nearly enough. I think it's coming up to three years ago and it just made a smile. My son found it because it said Miss Paris on it and that's how the children know me, Miss Paris or Madame Paris. She became Mini Miss Paris because it was just too confusing. The children see her as totally different from me so she had to have a different name. And then Pablo came on the scene because I felt that I needed to have a boy as well as a girl. So she acquired this male friend of hers about a year and a half ago now. So what do I do with Minimis Paris and Pablo? Normally I take them abroad with me and look for cultural opportunities to take photos of them. So it might be photos of them next to a famous monument or next to some food that we might not find in England, or different shops, all sorts of uh, photographs like that. But I felt I needed a bit of a change. And uh, this time round, so this is when I went to France uh, for Easter 2018, I decided to do Where Are Minimis Paris and Pablo sort of quiz. So I took photos of Minimis Paris and Pablo just doing things in France, but I took quite close-up photos. You can look at them in the link attached to this podcast. And what I did afterwards is I put them into a presentation with the children and give some multiple choice answers. So the question on each slide is, Où sont Minimis Paris et Pablo? And then they've got three possible answers which we read out as a class. Then I let the children think about it for a few seconds and they had a class vote. So to give you an example, they were standing in front of uh, bakers in France, all you could see was the baguettes. So the three options were à la boulangerie, à la charcuterie, à la confiserie. So the class had a vote and if the majority of the class votes for boulangerie, then they get the point. But if they vote for something different, then I get the point. So it's a competition between me and the class, which they love. Either as we go along or after going through the whole presentation, depending on the class, We've made some notes in our exercise books as well of the key words because I chose deliberately words that either my children should know from what I have taught them or I want them to know them. I have found that the children have been really engaged and motivated in this activity. They have relished being the language detectives that we want them to be, trying to work out which answer it's not, which it might possibly be and why, and it's been great. I would now like to talk about my top three types of authentic resources and by authentic resources I mean resources that were made for native speakers not resources that were made especially for learners of L2. So the first type that I love to use is any flyers, menus, leaflets that I can pick up when I'm in France or Spain. I normally try to get about five copies of anything that I can get my hands on because that's a nice number if you want to set up a sort of carousel activity where on the table you put some of the resources all the same with a set of questions or activities or challenges for the children to go through and then on the middle of the table if you've got another set of five resources if you've got enough to go around like this go so the children go from one table to the next have a certain set of time looking at a certain set 
of resources, then you don't need a whole class. Now, I know that I'm very lucky. I get to go to France three times a year to visit family, so I've got a massive collection of French resources. I don't have so much for Spain, but if you don't have immediate access to those, there's always the internet where you can download menus from restaurants and all sort of advertising things and flyers as well. The other way you can get your hands on some of those resources without going to the country is just ask your pupils when they go. I know I have a lot of children in the school where I teach Spanish that go on holiday in Spain. So whenever they tell me they're going to go, I'll make sure that I ask them anything free, any leaflets that you come across in Spanish, please pick them more, bring them back if you can. And okay, let's be honest, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally you have a child who'll come back with some resources that you can actually use in the classroom. The second resource I wanted to uh, mention is YouTube. I know sometimes with YouTube it's just where do you start because there is so much on there. So it's very important that we support each other as teachers and we share with each other our favourite YouTube videos and resources. We tend to use YouTube for listening practice, to add pronunciation, but recently I've been using it more for cultural awareness. For instance, the other day I was part of a, a whole different activity, which I mentioned in podcast one actually, to do with dictionary work. But I played this video video to my year three of some French children having lunch and from that video I let them take notes, write some words down in English of what they could see and then we did some dictionary work from that but it also led into a discussion about the differences between what the children were wearing in school in France, the type of food that they were eating, how much of it they were eating, how long they have for their lunch breaks and you could actually turn the volume off completely on these types of videos and let the children really watch actively without the distraction of the sounds. Of course, if you want to focus on listening skills, you don't have to show the videos to the children either. Or could do a whole episode just based on YouTube, but I thought I would mention it here. The third type of authentic resource that I wanted to talk about is, well, picture books, of course, because that's my thing, isn't it? That's what my passion, that's what I know most about, that's what I use most about. So there is a place in the classroom, of course, for books that the children are familiar with that were maybe translated from English or another language. But today I want to focus on those books that were originally written in French or Spanish or whatever language you teach, because they will have those little added touches, those elements of cultural awareness again. I'll give you an example. One of my favourite books is called Petite Taupe, Ouvre-moi ta porte. I don't want to spoil the whole story for you, but at one point, Petite Taupe and her friends have had a bit of a traumatic experience. And to get over this, what does Petite Taupe make? Soup à l'oignon? Some onion soup, of course. Then I tell the children about my wedding and how we served onion soup at half past five in the morning when all our English friends wanted to leave. They were tired. They said, surely we couldn't go now. And we're like, no, no, there's one more course and there's, there's the onion soup. And um, so this is something that you don't get in a story that was translated from another language. So authentic stories are always my preferred choice. Thanks for listening. Please give me some feedback. I'm always open to suggestions for future episodes. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't done so already, of course. Au revoir! That was Natalie Paris in episode 2 of Natalingo's Natter. <laughs>